Hello everyone, welcome to IAS Baba's 60 days rapid revision series for prelims 2022. This is day 30 and today we take up disaster management, epidemics and other science and technology related topics. So first one, the Zika. So Zika is transmitted by infected mosquitoes from AIDS genus, mainly the AIDS aegypti mosquitoes. Then the AIDS mosquitoes also spread dengue, chikungunya and yellow fever. So mark these as important facts and then the virus was first identified in Uganda in 1947 in monkeys. So monkeys were the first hosts and then the mode of transmission apart from mosquitoes an infected person can also spread the virus. So in the contact of the feces, mucus and other body fluids so it can also spread. Then come to next the symptoms. So generally symptoms include fever, rashes, conjunctivities that is the eye sores and then muscle pain, joint pain and others and then it lasts for 2 to 7 days and Zika virus infection during pregnancy can cause the infants to be born with microcephaly. So we should take care that pregnants will not get infected with Zika. So here we can see how the microcephaly works. So the actual head will be of this size and the microcephalic head will be very smaller when compared to that. And along with that, here we have other congenital malformations known as the congenital Zika syndrome. So other genetic disorders can also occur and then it has no treatment or vaccination. So mark it as very much important. Then instead, the focus is on relieving the symptoms and includes the rest, rehydration and then treatment for fever and body pains, etc. So mainly paracetamols and the analgesics are being taken. And then Ebola. Recently, World Health Organization has declared that the Ebola outbreak that started in February 2021 in Guinea is over now. The WHO in its list of 10 threats to the global health in 2019 also included Ebola. So this Ebola virus disease, it is caused by the Ebola virus and it was formerly known as Ebola hemorrhagic fever. So it's transmitted to people from wild animals and spreads in human population through human to human transmission. So it is a hemorrhagic fever. So what is a hemorrhage? It is a kind of blood clot that occurs in brain. So that is symptomized with the intense headache. So here also Ebola comes with intense headache. That is why hemorrhagic fever. Then Ebola virus was first discovered in 1976 near the Ebola river and in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. So near Congo river and Congo. So it was being uh, discovered. Then transmission fruit bats Teropodidae family are natural Ebola virus hosts and Ebola spreads via direct contact through broken skin or the mucous membrane. So all these zoonotic viruses and zoonotic diseases, they are spreading through the contact of the fluids, bodily fluids. Then coming more, symptoms include fever, fatigue, muscle pain, etc. Friends, most of the viral infections, they will be having the common symptoms that is the cold, cough, fever, body pain and then in extreme cases, vomiting and dysentery. And then diagnosis with help of ELISA and RT-PCR. So these are also the common most diagnosis techniques for viral diseases. So ELISA means enzyme linked immunosorbent assay and RT-PCR we already know that is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction and then the vaccines for Ebola. So here we have Erwebo and then Zebdenov and Moabia. So here the Ebola has a vaccine but Zika doesn't have any vaccine. Then treatment. Two monoclonal antibodies that is Inmazep and Ibanga have been approved for the treatment of the Zaire Ebola virus infection in adults and children by the US. So these two antibodies they can counter and we can use these two for the treatment. So for Ebola both vaccines and the treatments are available. Then come to next Nipah. So Nipah virus first appeared in Malaysia and Singapore in 1998-1999 and it first appeared in domestic pigs and then in dogs, cats and goats. The Nipah virus is caused by RNA virus of the family Paramyxoviridae and the genus Henipa virus. So it is an RNA virus. Then closely related to Hendra virus. This Nipah virus is very much resembling to the Hendra virus. Hendra virus is a rare emerging zoonosis that causes severe and often fatal disease in both infected horses and humans. So for both horses and humans, this Hendra virus that will infect. Then mode of transmission of Nipah, it spreads through fruit bats or flying foxes through excreta and other secretions of body fluids. Then human to human transmission and transmission through contaminated food is also possible. Then symptoms of Nipah virus, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea, fever, headache and mental issues or confusion. So here mental confusion. So this is a unique symptom of Nipah. Then treatment, no vaccine has been developed yet. Again, Nipah has no vaccine and no treatment. Then come to next air pollution in Delhi. So 
we have various causes for air pollution. So, for the prelims perspective, we will look into the steps taken by the government of India to curb air pollution. So, first step we go with the suffer air quality index. So, air quality that is being designated into good, moderate, unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy and then very unhealthy groups. So, here whenever the situation worsens, so a graded response action plan is taken up. So, that means if there is a yellow signal, one step or orange signal, another step, red signal, stringent step and purple signal, more stringent steps. So, likewise, for various grades, various actions has been designated and we also have the air quality early warning system. So, early warning system means before that worsens, we will get a prediction like, so tomorrow the air is going to worsen and we should take the necessary actions. And then we have the EPCA that is Environment Pollution Control Authority and it is a Supreme Court mandated body established in 1998 under Environment Protection Act 1986 to control pollution. But this has been abolished and the power for this is being vested by the Commission for Air Quality Management. So, with the new law that is Commission for Air Quality Management in the National Capital Region and the Adjoining Areas Act 2021, so under this. So, we have merged the EPCA. So, mark this as important and the act which has enacted this. Then come to next, Omicron and ESGN dropout. Friends, whenever we come across that Omisure kit, so Omisure kit, this was given for most of the doctors who are working in the Omicron pandemic times and here the COVID tests usually look into three target genes related to the parts of virus. That is one is the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein that is N2 or the envelope protein that is the E protein. So, here for Omicron, we are looking into the spike protein that is the S protein. So, the difference is that if we consider the delta variant or any other variants, so they have so many spike proteins around them. But as and when we speak about Omicron, so there is a considerable drop in the spike proteins. So, the Omicron has very few spike proteins around it. So, this dropout in the spike protein is encoded by the dropout in the gene that codes for the spike protein. So, that is why that yes gene dropout. If there is a yes gene dropout, so but obvious the variant is Omicron. So, Omisure checks for this yes gene dropout and if there is no yes gene dropout, so apart from Omicron, it might be any other variant. So, remember the Omicron, Omisure and the yes gene dropout related to it. Then come to next, the PM Cares Fund. So, we had the NDRF, we have the PM National Relief Fund. So, despite presence of all these, so PM Cares, so that was established and here PM Cares Fund has approved allocation of funds for setting up 55 pressure swing absorption medical oxygen generation plants. So, here we are developing some oxygen generation plants. So, how that oxygen is generated with the help of this pressure swing absorption technology. So, what is this pressure swing absorption technology? It is a technology used to separate some gases and the gas species from a mixture of gases. So, if there are mixture of the carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. So, by infusing pressure, we will separate one gas from this. And now, once the gas is coming out, so we will relieve the pressure. So, once the pressure is released, the pure gas which we separated, so that will come into existence. So, here we apply the pressure once to separate and after applying the pressure, then we release the pressure, so to purify that gas. So, this switching or the swinging of pressure from high pressure to low pressure is called the pressure swing absorption technique. So, the technology that is the pressure swing absorption technology which is applied for the oxygen generation. So, that gives the pressure swing absorption medical oxygen generation plants. So, now PM Cares Fund is funding this. So, mark this as important. Then the PM Cares, the Prime Minister's Citizen Assistant and Relief in Emergency Situations Fund was set up to accept donations and provide relief during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here the PM Cares was set up as a public charitable trust. Then it can avail donations from the foreign contribution and donations to fund can avail 100% tax exemption. So it is like they can accept foreign donation and here we have some FCREA relaxation for the PM Cares and also that we have 100% tax rebates on these donations. So remember these two clauses. And then Prime Minister is ex officio chairman of the PM Cares Fund and the Minister of Defense, Minister of Home and then Minister of Finance. So they are ex officio trustees of the fund. So it is being maintained by the highest level executive authority which is worth remembering. Then come to next International Solar Alliance. The fourth General Assembly of International Solar Alliance was held recently and we know that International Solar Alliance came into existence in the Paris Summit 2015 and Narendra Modi and Emmanuel Macron. So, they were the instrumental persons in setting up this. 
and we also have the India as the chairperson and France as the co-chairperson of the ISA and in India we also have the headquarters of this ISA. Then the key takeaways of this fourth general assembly. So fourth assembly of international solar alliance closes with a promise to achieve 1 trillion dollars investments in solar sector by 2030. So by 2030, so we have to invest 1 trillion dollars in solar energy and this includes a blended finance risk mitigation facility. So here the experts are investing so that the financial risks are being mitigated. Then ISA assembly gives a green light to the One Sun political declaration for the launch of Green Grids initiative that is One Sun, One World and One Grid. So we can call GGI Oso Vogue at COP26 Glasgow. Then ISA forges partnership with the Bloomberg Philanthropies and Global Energy Alliance for the People and Planet and new ISA program launched on the management of solar photovoltaic panels and battery usage, waste and solar hydrogen program. So various decisions have been taken up. So some facts that is the target and then the one sun one grid. So all these are worth remembering. Then the global methane pledge. Recently US president has announced the global methane pledge at the 26th COP26 that is the UNFCC Glasgow and then the pact between US and European Union sets a target for cutting at least 30% from the global methane emissions based on 2020 levels by 2030. So the 2020 is the benchmark and 2030 is the target and we will reduce the emissions by 30% and here if adopted around the world this would reduce the global heating by 0.2 degrees Celsius by 2040s compared with the likely temperature rise by then. So even if you count the likely temperature rise so if you cut the methane up to 30 percent so 0.2 degrees Celsius of reduction in the temperature rise can be expected and the world is now about 1.2 degrees Celsius hotter than in the pre-industrial times and here we have to remember that methane so that is produced by anthropogenic reasons more than the natural reasons so methane is the simplest hydrocarbon consisting of one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms that is the ch4 and it is flammable and it is used as a fuel worldwide. Then methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. So it is much more powerful, 80 times powerful than the carbon dioxide and it also persists in environment much more times and in much more durations than the CO2. So although CO2 is a potential greenhouse gas, so methane is much more potential than that. Then approximately 40% of methane emitted is from the natural sources and about 60% from anthropogeny. And here friends, we have to remember the cow farming, cattle rearing, then the sheep, goat rearing. So that emits more methane because these herbivorous animals, so they will be having a smaller stomach called the rumen. So whenever they eat the grass, so first it goes to rumen and here the half digested rumen, so that will be taken back to the mouth and here the cattle will chew it properly and then it will be sent to the original stomach. And whenever you speak of this journey, so here they have the methanogenesis bacteria are called the methanogens. These methanogenic bacteria, they will produce more and more methane. And when the cow dung or the goat pop is being put out, so more and more methane is being released. So that is why this cattle farming and goat rearing. So these are the major causes for the emission of methane. So that is why the world is going towards vegetarianism. Then come to next global declaration of forests. So recently an ambitious declaration was initiated by the UK to halt the deforestation and land degradation by 2030 and it is being referred to as the Glasgow leaders declaration on forests and land use. Then India did not sign this as it objected to trade being interlinked to climate change and forest issues in the agreement. So this agreement it not only contained the deforestation and other clauses. It also said that we are curbing deforestation by having a proper consumption habit, by having a proper infrastructure strategies and all those. So here India didn't want that infrastructure trade and others to be linked with environment. So that is why India didn't agree for this global declaration on forests. Then come to next, the declaration aims for sustainable production and consumption and infrastructure development, trade, finance and investments and support for smallholders then indigenous people and local communities who depend on the forest for their livelihood and have a key role in their stewardship. And then to achieve a balance between anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and removal by sinks. That means we have to make sure that we reduce emissions and also we enhance more and more sinks so that we sequester more and more carbon. 
and then to adapt to the climate change and maintain other ecosystem services. So these are the aims and here we can see this clause. So that was not accepted by India. Then come to next heat index. So here an heat index. So this combines air temperature and relative humidity. So to put forward a human perceived equivalent temperature. Say for example, if the moisture is more, even if the temperature is less, we feel it as hot because the sweat will not evaporate from our skin. But if the atmosphere is dry, so even if the temperature is high, we won't feel that heat because whatever sweat that comes out, it gets evaporated. So here maximum heat is felt when the humidity and temperature, so both are at optimum levels and if any of them varies, so we won't feel that. So that perceptive heat, so that is what is being discussed in this heat index and here there are different terms given to the heat index. First is the felt air temperature. That is the air temperature which a human being feels or maybe apparent temperature and then the real feel and then the heat index contains the following. So here the human body mass and the height of the human body, then clothing, then amount of physical activity, then individual heat tolerance and sunlight and ultraviolet radiation exposure and then the wind speed. So here all are included because the human body and the mass, so this suggests to what extent the human being is sweating then clothing so this also decides the sweating of a human being then the amount of physical activity so this again decides the sweating then individual heat tolerance as it is a perceptive heat so the individual's tolerance also matters then sunlight and ultraviolet radiation exposure so again the intense of heat so that is recognized by the exposure to the incoming solar radiations then the wind speed so this decides whether the water is being evaporated or not and then come to next the heat index in India. India's first ever heat index was introduced by the Indian Meteorological Department in 2016. And in 2017, IMD brought an interactive map charting the heat index status in different states of the country. So for different states, different heat index was being brought out. And then an interactive map denoted colors varying from blue to orange, which indicates stress placed on the human beings by climatic conditions of the time. So here, as and when the climate is changing, so again, this heat index is very much needed and we have to study more and more on this. Only then we can adopt to the climate change. Then come to next, the leaded petrol eradicated. So the use of leaded petrol has been eradicated from the globe as per the observation made by UNEP and India banned leaded petrol in March 2000. So what is this leaded petrol? Friends, we know that the knocking of an engine. So say for example, this is the engine and this is the shaft and this shaft it moves up and down inside this engine and as and when this shaft comes down so here in this corner the petrol will be plumed so the petrol will spray some droplets and when the petrol is sprayed and this spray will catch fire and it will burn and once this burns the heat will be produced and the energy will be generated but this only has to spray it should not vomit more petrol here Say for example, petrol is having less viscosity. So in such cases, it will not spray, it will plume, it will vomit so much of petrol so that not only this chamber, the whole engine starts burning. So when this happens, so the engine starts the knocking sound. So if you raise the accelerator, you'll feel that knock. So that is why to curb this knocking, so what we have to do, we should increase the viscosity of the petrol. To increase the viscosity of the petrol, we are adding lead to it. So that we call it as the leaded petrol. So this leaded petrol that was increasing the presence of lead in the environment and also in the human body. So that lead exposure was highly harmful. That is why the leaded petrol was banned. Then at high levels of exposure, this lead attacks the brain and central nervous system to cause coma, convulsions and even deaths. And it causes very huge mental trauma. And children who survive severe lead poisoning may be left with mental retardation and behavioral disorders. Then lead in bone is released into blood during pregnancy and becomes a source of exposure to the development of fetus. So even the fetus will not develop properly if the mother is exposed for this lead. Then the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation estimated that in 2017, lead exposure accounted for 1.06 million deaths and 24.4 million years of healthy life lost. That is the DALIS, disability adjusted life years. So here, whatever life we lost due to disability that we are excluding. And then lead also causes long-term harm in adults, including increased risk of 
high blood pressure and kidney damages so here we don't know what not the lead does but lead can do every damage it can whenever it enters the body so that is why the banning of the leaded petrol was a very welcome step then come to next chhattisgarh's state animal wild buffalo so that has come close to extinction here the sole female wild buffalo in a conservation center at chhattisgarh's udanti sitanadi tiger reserve so that died recently and here chhattisgarh's state animal is in the verge of extinction with less than 20 individuals of species left in that state then the conservation center had only one female and three males and now no more female wild buffaloes are left in the reserve so here it is like mostly in the udanti sitanadi almost all have died except those that are present in this conservation reserve but these wild buffaloes are present in other national parks and wildlife sanctuaries also and only minimum that is 4 to 5000 are surviving so if those die then this species will go to extinction and then more about wild water buffaloes it is associated with the wet grasslands swamps then flood plains and densely vegetated river valleys and it is included in the sites appendix 3 and it is legally protected in bhutan india nepal and thailand then iucn red list status so it is endangered in that and the remaining population totals less than 4000 but of which 90% live in india and mostly in assam and it is found in other national parks and wildlife sanctuaries like in assam kaziranga manas debru shikova others and then in arunachal pradesh during memorial wildlife sanctuary then in meghalaya balfakram and in chatisgarh indravati national park so here we have an assignment so go to map and locate this lokova and then bura chapori and others so whichever names so that are being in news but which are not present in the basic books so that we have to give importance for so this was all about the wild buffalo then come to next groundswell report so recently the updated groundswell report released by world bank so remember groundswell report is being released by the world bank indicated that climate change could force 216 million people across six world regions to move within their countries by 2050 and this groundswell report that deals with the environmental migration or the climate change related migrations so remember groundswell then world bank and the climate change related migrations then hotspots of internal climate migration can emerge as early as 2030 and continue to spread and intensify by 2050 so this is the time during which the migration peaks then the first groundswell report so it was published in 2018 and used a robust and novel modeling approach to understand the scale trajectory and spatial patterns of future climate migrations in various countries like africa south asia and latin america so this was true like we have also seen from africa many people they migrated to europe and that was an issue four to five years before then in the second groundswell report so that builds on the first report applying the same approach to three new regions that is in the middle east north africa so then eastern europe etc so how for the resources for the water for the land etc how the nations are fighting now so this is the best evidence and this is the best prediction the groundswell report can ever give then the report also gives qualitative analysis of climate related mobility in countries of mashriq that is the eastern part of arab world then in the sids that is the small island developing countries friends you know that this sids and some of the islands so they are being worst victims of the climate change and the global sea level rise so that is why these reports they become important then arsenic contamination of food chain so recently a study in bihar has found arsenic contamination not only in the ground water but in the food chain as well and here we have the molecular formula of arsenic then the major findings so arsenic has found its way into the food chain mainly rice wheat and potato earlier it was only present in ground water and now it is in the food arsenic is present in the ground water as it is used on a large scale for the irrigation by farmers and that is how it has found its way to the food chain and then the arsenic is an odorless tasteless metalloid widely distributed in the earth's crust and it is naturally present at high levels in the earth crust and groundwater of a number of countries it is highly toxic in its inorganic form so that means if it is not bound to any carbon so then it is highly toxic then arsenicosis is the medical word for arsenic poisoning which occurs due to accumulation of large amounts of arsenic in the body then long term exposure to arsenic from drinking water and food can cause cancer and skin lesions and it has also been associated with cardiovascular diseases and diabetes so that's why with so much of harm if arsenic is continuously entering the food chain so it is a time where we have to stop 
and it is the time to ring the alarm bells. Then come to next, conversion of high ash Indian coal to methanol. So India has developed an indigenous technology to convert high ash Indian coal to methanol and established its first pilot plant in Hyderabad. So mark Hyderabad as important. So here we know that India has only brown coal, not black coal and brown coal it releases more ash content. And now if we convert this into methanol, so then we have more productivity. Say for example, the productivity we obtain when we burn this ash and then obtain the thermal energy out of it. And the productivity we obtain when we convert this into methanol, which is itself a fuel, so is more than the former one. So that is why and this will help the country move towards adoption of clean technology. And we promote the use of methanol as a transportation fuel, that is ethanol blending. And then the process and how we have to convert. The broad process of converting coal into methanol consists of conversion of coal into synthesis gas. Synthesis gas means it is a syngas. That means it consists of various gases. Okay. Say for example, the methane, ethane, butane, propane, hexane, all those things. And syngas cleaning and conditioning. So after the syngas is obtained, we will extract methanol from it and then we will cool it and we will hydrate it. And once we hydrate this, so methane will convert into methanol. And now we will extract and purify this. And once we do this, so methanol is obtained. Now the challenge is that, so if ethanol was formed from the black coal, that is the low ash containing coal, so we would have had greater productivity. But again, this brown coal, so this is not so conducive for generation of methanol. So whatever it might be, but we have the brown coal in excess and it is our bonded duty to use them and not go in search of those black hole, which is already expensive. Being prudent will fetch more than being idealistic. Then coming to the last part, friends, as we have been studying the environment and ecology, so it is time to remember that India is also striving towards a clean environment. But the thing is that we have to fill and we expect the others to pick it up. So we will pollute and we expect others to rid of that pollution. So instead of that, if we think that we can avoid from filthing, we can avoid from polluting, so then we can have a very beautiful nation to live in. So here we should remember like a nation is not rich whenever a poor man buys a car, but a nation is rich whenever a rich man catches the public transport. So we will change our habits and then we will maintain that our nation will be handed over with the purest form to our posterity. So we will do it all the very best. Good luck friends.